All right, hey guys, welcome back to the DFM podcast. And on this episode, I have Jake Jackson with me. He's mix and master engineer at Air Studios and also the chief sound engineer for Spitfire Audio. So, Jake, if you'd like to introduce yourself, you can be as brief as you want or uh, you can be short. It's up to you. <laughs> Hi, Dean. Um, um, pleasure to be here. Thanks for asking me. Um, yeah, I am um, a recording engineer chiefly. Recording and mix engineer is what I kind of do most of my time. Um, when I'm not uh, locked up, obviously. Um, <laughs> but um, it's, yeah, recording orchestras, soundtracks is what I've done for the last 20 odd years. I started at Air Studios in London, um, 1998. Uh, so Before I was born. Yeah, I know, it's crazy. Um, 22 years ago. Um, and yeah, I kind of fell in love with soundtracks and then just basically kind of just been um, working on it ever since, really. It's, it's really, it's a great thing and I got involved with Spitfire which was lovely um, mm -hmm. and from there I've just kind of done my own thing really you know um, just it's great to be involved with a company like, company like Spitfire because it's you know they're they're really pushing the industry which is yeah. interesting and as well but it also gets my name out to more people which is cool and I can do mm -hmm. more things like this which is great um, but um, I also do love doing the kind of big orchestral soundtracks there's something yeah. really thrilling about hearing a orchestra and that's what i'm really missing in this time of covid is <laughs> is uh is hearing real musicians i was trying to i was um you know having having that um um at that time um you know with real musicians is is i didn't really miss it quite so much so yeah, yeah that's that really yeah I was actually going to sort of ask you about the sort of Spitfire thing because I've had one or two composers on here before you and obviously most composers that work in profession or even amateurs at this point, all of you is really Spitfire at this point. Um, are you, were you there from the start and have been involved in basically every main library and how did sort of come about in the first place? Um, I've, I was there at the first one. I wasn't the engineer actually. I was the uh, tape op on the very first one. Oh, okay. um, ran the, ran the, uh, ran the Pro Tools and the, and the, and the analog tape machine. Um, and um and it kind of came along from that really um i then took over as the engineer and um and i was involved uh, basically i've record i record everything that goes through um air pretty much apart from um the only things that i haven't done at air are the hans zimmer stuff because he uses his team yeah i didn't do, and i didn't do the studio series or the, the uh, smaller room stuff um at air but i've done that all of the albions all of the uh, all of the kind of um modular library which used to be called which is now called symphonic stuff i think symphonic stuff and, yeah um, symphonic series all the solo st instruments the percussion harp and all that kind of stuff and and obviously then the bbc symphony orchestra as well which is uh, the uh, new big one the, yeah. yeah the new big one so um that's really kind of fun and interesting and so um it came about because i knew christian and paul really and so they were they were kind of clients and friends of mine and and um that was that really it started off as their small idea and then um it's kind of grown into this kind of big thing that's big. just <laughs> yeah it's great because they you know they just understand what um what composers want because they are composers and um you know and and the people like the hands have got involved which is great and gives it more kudos um and you know they just work hard they've always you know they've just got a great work ethic and 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 want to please people and want to make things that people want to use and so it's just worked that way and the recording part of it's very simple we just we um we record the musicians playing the notes and try and make it as much a natural performance as possible mm -hmm. um there's a magic that goes on behind the scenes but essentially it's 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 just that and we try and make it it's you know it's it's not particularly enjoyable for the visions, but we try and make it. Um, excuse me, I'm going to sneeze. No, you're fine. Um, we try and make it, um, you know, like not arduous for them. And um, actually, they tend to quite enjoy it because it becomes this amazing, like, practice experience for them to mm, play these notes, yeah. single notes in tune and with the perfect kind of thing. And they actually they end up taking over producing it almost to a certain <laughs> degree, particularly when there's. A small number of them or you know certainly soloists or a small number they actually then take over their kind of production of it because they know actually how they want each note to sound so they say no no mm. i want to do that one again i want to do that again and um so it's really evolved to this nice thing and so it's um it's yeah it's, it's a it's a kind of great it's a great it's a great um thing to be involved in and um you mentioned like all the other sort of ensembles and solos you've recorded and i was i was kind of wondering as a recording and sort of a mixing standpoint what would be like 
What ensembles would you find the easiest or most difficult to work with? And the same with solo instruments as well. Feel like this is now from a recording point of view. Yeah, from a recording point of view, from going yeah, force and recording I'll, into getting it going. Well, this is the bigger they are, the easier they are. Because, um, I mean, well, in terms of, there's, well, there's different amount. You've got it's one of those triangles, probably. We could probably, I haven't thought mm. about this way before. There must be one of those triangles. It's kind of stress on one point. <laughs> then there's um, cost, I guess, on the other. And then there's, um, you know, like kind of sound, I guess, on the other. And, um, or time, probably, it's probably time in terms of like recording time and you know, like mixing time, whatever you might call it. So happiness isn't there until, until the end. <laughs> no, exactly. No, I think, well, no, it's different. It's different. But we answer the first part of the question and then, then, ask, then get me to ask you about the happiness thing. Mm -hmm. um, but um, certainly the size makes a difference because with more musicians, you get a bigger sound and a bigger mm -hmm. ensemble and less of the issues like tuning and yeah, the intricate uh, sort of sounds yeah, yeah but then timing gets a little bit worse well no it doesn't because it gets kind of covered up so you have it's kind of sometimes you cover timing is kind of an issue maybe it doesn't um get more noises but that's kind of not that, <laughs> not that important um um but you certainly get but then you get more kind of goosebumps often because you get like a yeah. big, or, there's yeah, nothing yeah. like hearing a big orchestral set up but I mean, it takes a lot longer to set up so there's that point of view and then the stress of it is um you know there's more to go wrong if it goes wrong there's more to fix quickly if you know what i mean mm -hmm. um but um but some of the most beautiful you know um film schools i've done uh, with small people like nick cave and warren ellis they're you know they're small they're small the two of them doing stuff and we do it in just kind of like working through ideas and that's just one or two players at a time and that's you know that's as rewarding as an 80 piece you know Mm -hmm. orchestra doing you know doing a big disney movie for example it's kind of it's it's that or a small you know like a kind of small really talented composer with a group of quartet or or i did a, a film that's coming up later this year called the green uh, knight with a, a composer called um daniel hart sorry his mm -hmm. name just escaped me and um i've worked with previously on a big orchestra and big or big orchestra for a disney film and this is a much smaller um interesting on ensemble but we did things like uh, six cello and then seven singers and uh, a recorder quartet and some okay. drums and things like that and so two percussionists and that was really great to get those different sounds and different ensembles yeah. so it's a very difficult question to answer that really there's lots of exciting things like you get you get you get much more of the spine tingling from the big orchestra mm. hearing a, a big theme that either you know you've heard before or it's being replayed for the you know 10th time yeah. of the movie there's about that and some of my greatest memories of seeing like the first time I record, I was a tape off on a Bond film, for example, and hearing <laughs> that theme being played, and then and then doing a playback, and all the orchestra kind of crammed into the tiny <laughs> control room, and there's people standing on top of each other, and and everyone's just like kind of cheering along with the you know with the stunts and stuff like that. I mean, that's you know a great memory of of uh, of that. Um, um, but then there's something really nice about hearing those small things, and when they come together, and you overdub them, and, and then you mix it, and you realise how they're all working together. It's, there's something fantastic mm. about that too. But yeah, with a smaller ensemble, it's um, it definitely it's more difficult for. And if you take the modern way, when you overdub things and you and you have them, and then you've got to kind of everything wants needs to be so polished now. There's no kind mm -hmm. of difficult to let little things slide because because you've got you don't do as many recordings, and so because you need to do more, you know, the time is the budgets are a problem, so mm -hmm. you rush through the recordings. But by rushing through the recordings, you give yourself more post-production work because you kind of go where you do another take and fix the, yeah, fix yeah. the tuning or fix the timing. You um, you have to go back and fix that stuff, which is fine. But then you don't just fix one thing. You kind of start then fixing everything. Do you know yeah, yeah. that kind of thing? Once you start fixing it, then you've opened up that fixing it kind of can of worms and then you have to go and fix it. Um, and there's less, if you've got 80 people playing together, there's less fixes you can do. It's like, is that the best take? Is that the best take? Is that the best take? Three chops kind mm -hmm. of thing. And that's it. But if you've got, you know, a quartet and then a two percussion and then a choir or whatever, and then you add them together, then then the editing can not never stop because you suddenly mm -hmm. like, oh, what well, if we move that one and move that one around? Because you can hear it much more clearly, you can move it around and you know, it becomes much more like that. So it's um 
it's a it's a very difficult question to answer. <laughs> I'm being, I'll, answer, I, I'll answer it in that roundabout way for you. In being a recording guy yourself, as libraries have sort of progressed, um, you see more and more mic positions sort of show up as libraries go on. And composers talk about this sort of like sometimes they don't even use some of the mic positions that are actually recorded on some libraries nowadays. Do you find some are really underutilized and actually should be sort of utilized more or to an extent people are kind of overdoing it to an extent where they actually don't need this amount of mic sort of positions? <laughs> Good question, really. I think um, I think the best way to answer that is that there are a few things, you know, the, the, the Albion, so we, let's just talk it from Spitfire point of view because obviously that's, you know, that's something that's close to my heart and, okay. you know, I've made those things. So, they use the close to tree ambience and outriggers and that's kind of pretty much what I'd use in a mix and that's mm -hmm. that's fine. If you then take it to something like the BBC Symphony Orchestra Library, mm -hmm. um, there's obviously a lot more. But I mean, there's if if I was the idea is that you're covering all of the options that you might need in a different scenario. So yes, you may only use end up using three or four, but and I may think in my mixes of those I may have used maybe eight or something like that of the, of the 19 that are there but there are some there for atmos and there's some there for the thing is i think because it's now only a small amount of data and actually putting it up and the, putting the microphones up isn't a big deal that it you know it's it's better to almost future proof yourself at that recording stage yeah and then and in fact that's what happens a lot with the smaller small smaller libraries is that we might end up recording more, but we discard them at, at the yeah. editing stage or post-production stage because there isn't a, there isn't a point. But we have them there. Sometimes it's useful if there's a you know if if there is for example a technical issue, then you might be able to cover yourself by using a different mic position for you know one thing. Um, but you, you know it's it, we try and make sure there's no technical issues. But sometimes you know there might be a fly or something that lands on a, <laughs> on a you know things like that have happened. You know like you know, it's, you know, yeah, you know, stupid things like that. But um, you obviously can't noise release, noise reduction that. Um, but in terms of are there too many? I don't think so because it's it's it is but it is a the question. The thing is, it's it's like in most in a lot of circumstances you may not end up using them, but in some circumstances you will, and so and mm -hmm. it will make a difference. And so, and particularly if now, for example, if you're a composer and you've been asked to deliver something like this week and you can't um record an orchestra because you know we can't then actually you know like being able to go and and the, the point the, the reason we made so many oh sorry i cut myself off but the, the, the main point i'm trying to make is that the whole thing about the bbc library which does have a lot of mic positions but that was deliberate is because it, it wanted to be this does everything plug-in so mm -hmm. that if um, um, if you have it, I have it, and you just send me a MIDI file, I can, you know, yeah. a, a, MIDI, a logic session. I can make those changes and, and make some things go. Okay, right, fine. Well, this is this is going to be a, um, a, in, a close intimate score, or it's going to be a big luscious film score, and then we can move those those positions around. Yeah. And without some of those film, those positions, that wouldn't be possible. And so, but some people may want to use it as a solo flute. Maybe you want to use it, use it one time for a solo flute patch, at which point you want to use the close, but then the tree is too far away. So then you want to use the wind room, you know, close pair mic, mm -hmm. for example. And so that adds that up. But then it's like, then, but then somebody, but then John Powell asked for spill mics. So therefore, then we added spill mics. <laughs> so there's a kind of a whole, you know, it's like you don't say no to someone like that because that's, you know, he, he wanted to have that and it, and it was a really interesting thing to do. We haven't done it before. So, like, let's do it. Let's so do it adds, it, yeah. so it adds. It adds to it, but you can, you know, like there are, you know, you can utilize different versions of that. And I think, you know, the mixes are great, but you need more than that for most, for most, you know, most purposes. And so that's, you know, that's the kind of point, really. And when it comes actually back to sort of the ensemble type thing, obviously your main genre or cargo would be in film and game scores now, but I've seen on your bio that you have done sort of rock and album recordings different yeah, things yeah, and, yeah, yeah. and when it comes to recording something different away from or maybe even, even like a concert band or a jazz band does much change or does any do you find them sort of smaller groups easier to actually get done 
or is is like the pinnacle of sort of big film scoring? That's the most difficult one, just for obviously the size of the actual ensemble and so on. Um, in terms of mixing, you mean? Um, yeah, mixing, yeah, recording and going into mixing. I suppose the recording the small, the less amount of people, it easier to extent be obviously depending yeah, on the this, instruments. It can, yeah, I mean, it's, it's quite easy to set up, but it's more difficult in terms of there's more not egos, but there's more people to ple- please. You know, if you're an mm-hmm. orchestra, there's more people, but they they kind of self govern themselves with like headphone fees, for example. It's like you mm-hmm. know, they become they all have to agree to disagree straight away. But with a small or, or, or ensemble. Everyone needs to hear each other much more clearly, you know, because if, if you're doing a film score, they don't really need to hear, they don't actually like to hear what's going on. They just like to hear a click and play with the click. Yeah. So they can hear each other in tune. But if you're playing on ensemble, they all need to hear each other very clearly because how they inter- interact with each other is, is important. Mm. So it's more complicated from that point of view. But once you get that set up, then it's ready to go. You know, you can, you can go quite quickly. Um, but there's obviously a lot more questions often when there's sort of, you know, smaller groups. You know, yeah. so you know, like in a, if, if you're talking about a small film film session, then it, yeah, there's there's smaller, more questions to ask. If you're in a band, I guess there's less questions, particularly if you've if you've um, if you've um, rehearsed it. Rehearsed, you know, yeah. But um, but um, bands things different because you spend a lot more time. You know, because it's traditionally you spend much more time on a band album anyway because you're still working to ideas or you're working mm-hmm. on the sound. You might spend cut about getting guitar sound up and and that I mean it's then it's all about the playing and playing the vibe and just getting take after take to get that real the real purpose and would the of amplification thing. of would a band make a big difference in the long run no not really it's just as simple as setting up an amp really or does it actually make a difference it's, really does it simple I mean, setting up an amp really it's, it's, you know it's you know, you can just you can decide how you're going to do it in terms of you know how much room you want to put on the amp for example yeah and that's those things but but they're all kind of I, I, I go into each of those sessions and with the same, you know, we allow a certain amount of time for setup, but I go into it with the same kind of, the same mindset pretty much. And, and, yeah. and but, I mean, the idea is that if you, if you can make a great recording, then the mixing is much easier. So, yeah. you know, it is about getting a great recording and make sure that everyone's happy because I often think that, that if the musicians are happy, then they'll get a much better performance than, than if they're waiting around, you know, like, some uh, waiting for you to get a great sound you know what i mean i think so, sometimes mm-hmm. there, there is sometimes you have to sacrifice if depending on the, the, the on the project and the time involved but sometimes you have to kind of like forego a great sound if someone's itching to get a performance out of them then you do something that's gonna you know if, you, if you're in a student band for a month then great spend mm-hmm. a day setting up all the mic and doing sounds but if you've got a, mu- a musician for two hours and you spend the first half an hour like that, they go, oh no, we haven't quite got the piano in the right place or the right mic, let's change the mics. Then you're, yeah. then you're going to end up losing the performance. And and um, someone like Nick Cave is very, um, is very keen to get his ideas down. So he won't, you know, and he never, he's never commented once on the sound I make. It's all about making sure that he gets his performance out. Mm-hmm. So it's like, because I know I can make it sound how he wants to hear it later, but it's like, you know, if I miss the performance, then, then, do you know what I mean? It's like, what's the, what was the point, yeah. really? And you mentioned there about actually um, good, uh, if, it, if it's written well, it, it takes sort of less time to mix it. And a lot of people have said that recently for a sort of MIDI orchestration to an extent, because a lot of people don't have the budgets to record orchestras and et cetera. And they're saying, well, if you actually just write the music well, you actually won't have to use a lot of plugins and learn learn how to mix really well if it's written well. Would that be the same if you get a good orchestrator and the piece just comes in well? Absolutely. There's, there's, it's absolutely. I mean, I'll, I'll, there's two things I'll answer that. First of all, is the the MIDI kind of stuff. Is that, yeah, I think people often try and over mix their orchestral, their orchestral um, tracks, MIDI orchestral tracks. I think they try and think they have to do too much. If you're using a well recorded sample library, whether it be a Spitfire one or you know a capacitors of of, of theirs, then they should sound great out of the box without too much needing to do to mm-hmm. a bit of reverb and a balance but you should be able to do most of it with balance really because they're you know they've been recorded in a room where it's designed to be and if i'm mixing a spitfire based um mix and i will do very little a tiny bit of eq um on certain things because was when you depending on how people stack them up they often can go a bit a bit harsh sometimes mm-hmm. but that's about it but i don't do anything else really 
and then it's all just balance. And so I think that's important. And again, then with a real orchestra, um, balance then becomes important within, within yeah. making it sound realistic. It's all about being realistic. And again, again, obviously orchestras balance themselves, but if sometimes if you're in a room like uh, the Hall of Air, then the brass really carries through there. So you have yeah. to ask them to sit back on that and play quietly, particularly if it's you know, three trumpets and six horns versus a smallish, <coughs> a smallish um, string section because of budgets. You know, you know, you know, they're used to three trumpets used to playing against a massive full symphony orchestra of yeah. sixty odd strings, but it might be with forty. So therefore, okay, they have to play down a bit, and that that's that. But again, it's down to balance and um, and um, and musicianship, really. Yeah, and I was just thinking there actually when you're mentioned sort of reverb, do you obviously when it comes to the Spitfire libraries, they're they're not wet wet when it comes to sound but they're tr they're wet enough like over and that's probably due to air studios in general and the hall yeah do you yeah. do you think it's because this is sort of an argument you hear back and forth like some composers say oh no actually i prefer a much drier sample so then i can adjust the reverb myself to get it that way or do you find there's negative negatives and benefits to having sort of a, a bit of a wetter sound straight out of the box or how do you find well, the, the kind of sound? The, the, the wetter sound of the box generally means it's been recorded in a, in a better room. Do you know what I mean? Because mm -hmm. you can use the room. So therefore, I mean, <clears throat> I think that air is a great recording room. So therefore, it makes sense that that is, um, you use, utilise that. And that and, it, and anybody doing a recording in there for a Hollywood or any sort of film will mm -hmm. use the room. And so therefore, that's, so therefore, I think they should be used. Therefore, you can't have it dry, if you know what I mean. Yeah. Um, if you want a different experience, then use a different, then use a different, um, different libraries that are, are drier. But you know, the, so much of a good string sound, particularly or any orchestral sound, is the room. It's really important. Yeah. So, yeah, and I will always add a tiny bit of reverb to it because you lose some of the reverb anyway in in the in the editing process and the noise reduction process that all all software libraries have to do. Mm -hmm. And I was just I was uh, going to ask actually, kind of. I want to think more things going forward. And this could be for anyone sort of listening to this that is either really interested in the sound or, as I said, if they can't sort of get the budget to record real uh, players, but they might have some instruments themselves. If you could sort of recommend good, good equipment to win a, win a particular sort of prize range when it comes to recording. Yeah, of course. Yeah. yeah, of course. Happy to. So, I mean, where you record it is important. So record it in a room that's, you know, generally a drier room. Um, if you're just recording on a kind of single mic so that you're kind of getting not too much of the room so it's close up. I'm sorry, my hair is really bad today. Um, um, and then um, if, you know, if you've got a, just one mic, if you've got like, if you've got more than one mic, then have like a stereo room pair kind of thing and a, and a close up mic. But if you've just got one, do close, depending on what your, if it's a louder instrument, then don't have it too close basically is my, is my, is my thing. Um, any string instrument about any you know like um like violin about a meter away or so like that. any kind of woodwind instrument about a meter away um brass instrument probably about a meter away guitarist guitar acoustic guitar is much closer piano mm -hmm. close maybe like 20 or 30 centimeters away from the strings depending on what you want really um and piano should always be in stereo um and then microphone is important um most of the time you can get away with it, you know, like a good condenser mic is, is, is good. And to be honest with you, most of the time, most of these condenser mics these days are within, you know, you won't hear a huge amount of difference between what mm -hmm. you do. Where it's positioned and your own instrument will make is more of a difference than the actual microphone it is. You know what I mean? Okay. If you had, uh, to a certain degree, I mean, nobody, you could record something for me and I wouldn't be able to tell you what microphone it's recorded on. Okay. Example. I could probably tell you, I'm not much of a guitarist, but some guitarists will be able to tell you what the guitar you played it on would be, for example, because it's that kind of thing. But if you if you if you sent me two, you know, a 500 pound condenser mic and a 3,000 pound condenser mic, and said to me one of these is a, you know, is a Shure mic and one is a Neumann, for example, mm -hmm. I would probably struggle to tell you which one's which because because without do you know what I mean? It's like I would tell you which one I liked. But that depends on the person playing it. Depends yeah. on what it yeah. is. You know what I mean? It's like 
depends on the performance and what's what the instrument is and how it's being played and where it's positioned is mm -hmm. is almost more you know so um if you've got the money then yeah do spend a certain amount on a microphone but don't go mental if you haven't got a great room you know go you know spend you know you can get some fantastic mics for a thousand pounds for example but you can get some really good mics for a couple of hundred quid you know what i mean yeah um and then you know like as, a, a, as good a converter as you can afford um and a good cable is important as well and i'm not you know not a gold one i'm not going to get by gold one but just a you know, good a good a good shielded balanced cable um and then you know some good headphones is important as well so that you know you say so you you can hear what you want to do and then just spend a little bit of time working out where your instrument sounds the best mm. you know so if you can if you can get somebody else to move the microphone around for you, for example, while you're playing and you put the headphones on yourself and just play it as someone moves it around, great. If not, try a few different places and, and play something, say where you where the microphone is or mark it on the floor and do a few different tests and listen through to that. And that is that will end up I, I you know would be end up be a great recording. Don't just do the first place, try three or four places and 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 and, and see. Great. And you mentioned there actually about sounds and you, you wouldn't be able to notice the difference. I'm wondering if you listened to a piece of music and it was straight Spitfire libraries at this point, would you be able to tell after recording so many Spitfire libraries that it is a Spitfire library being used? Oh, well, rather than rather than a, a competitor's one, you mean? Yeah, rather than like say Cinesams or some because the composer yeah. would say, "Oh, I can tell that that's like." And let me think of it. Damage is always used for percussion a lot of the time from heavy ossy. Like if you yeah, hear I mean, a certain I mean, Spitfire library, I mean, there's certain there's certain samples you you can recognise. For example, yeah, for, of course. Um, Depends how many layers it is, you know what I mean? It's yeah. like, yeah, I think that's, I think it's, you know, it covers it up, but um, I can certainly tell if it was one. I, I think I do know when it's the air, the, the air ones, for example. Yeah, yeah. it's got a, it's got a, it's because it's just, it's in my, you know, it's all I've heard in your from. DNA at this point. It's just to get that yeah, hall, the, just to re yeah. have to reverse in that hall, and just yeah. the sound. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's, um, it's a good question. I don't know if I could really, I probably, but I don't know. Don't you, you can they try it after this. Well, because I can always see what it because I always, you know, people, I can always see what it is because the people, you know, if they send they, they labeled what the what the uh, sample is. But um, yeah, there's there's something to challenge your, your golden ears with now after this. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, my ears are funny. I'm 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 I I care a lot about sound, but I don't care how it's made. If you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like it's like it's the end product if it, that, that if, it's, if it sounds good then it is good do you know what i mean mm -hmm. it's that it's very much that you know like like i said about the you know microphone it, you may use a you know a 50 pound microphone or you might use a 500 pound microphone but if it's if it's the if it's the one that captures a better performance then use that one i, mm -hmm. I did that with a a vocal i was doing a few years ago where the artist said oh, i want to record this i was recording it with a like a 67 or something like that, and he was like no i want to try this with a <coughs> SM57 as well, please. And I was like, okay. And then I listened to it back and I was like, wow, that sounds amazing. And, it, and we used the, just the 57 in certain places because it really, um, it really had a vibe for, for that song. You know, it was like, oh, okay. And it really opened my eyes up to like, you know, it's not always about the, it's not always about the, um, about, about the, um, about the, you know, about, about the quality of the mic sometimes. It's about the performance and, and the way you can do that. You know, I've seen, mm -hmm. People famous, you know, famous singers sound in the control room, you know, like singing with a it's a fifty eight in the middle of the control room because that's well, they get a great great performance, you know, and that's mm -hmm. that's cool, you know. So, I'm just thinking because you've recorded so much over the years now, is there any instrument sort of left on your list? You're like, oh, I'd actually, oh, I'd love to hear that being performed and recorded because there's obviously there's obviously you'll find like weird instruments out there you just that you might like the sound of, but you haven't got the chance to sort of hear live or record. Um, oh. At, yeah. Sort of wonder. Well, uh, I did see a while ago uh, about there's a couple of weird instruments. There's a couple of weird instruments I've seen. There's there was a piano that you can adjust the tuning like with like it's, I can't remember what, who made it, but it was like a you can almost adjust the tuning of it. It sounded really really amazing. Okay. You kind of like, movable things, and that sounded really interesting. And then, um, but in terms of like real instruments and stuff, I've recorded I've recorded some strange ones. I recorded an alpine horn before. I've recorded. <laughs> You know, like um, glass harmonica. We've done plenty of those. Yeah. Done all the kind of. Um, I mean, I'm trying to think of what what real instrument like. Have you done a thermal? 
No, I haven't done a sermon. No. I, I'm trying no. to think how would that record with with just being sort of no, real you know sound wave based. I think I might have done a sermon as a tape op actually. Well, a long time ago on a on a Muppets movie, there was a <laughs> there was a sermon. I think it might have been the sermon on that. I think that was a had a had a um, had a DI output. I think maybe actually probably is what it what it was. Um, let me think. What else is there? I mean, I like things like harpsichords are great to record because they just you know they they invoke a certain sound. Um, what else? I'm sure there is something, but I can't really think of what it is. I'm afraid. I I love to record. I love to record more brass bands because that was what I started out as a musician as from when I was a kind of young a young lad till I was my twenties was playing in brass bands and. I really what instrument? I made the sound. Oh, euphonium. Oh, okay. I play sax. And, uh, so I, I do. Yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, and so that's one thing I love to. I love I'd love to do a bit more of because I've done plenty of big bands but I but I like to do more brass bands but um only a few times they're not a bit out, a bit untraditional now in um in uh, in film scores but a couple of times they've been there it's been amazing and it's just you want to record them more for the nostalgia feel rather than the actual enjoyment like just the recording well, part I think, well I think it's both I think it's yeah. like I think I'd love to I love to have a challenge of, of recording a brass band because it's not that straightforward and. You, and Why wouldn't get, it be that straightforward to an extent? It's well, just for the sheer power of it. Or, sheer power of it, and also, you know, they're like some instrument. Just because they all kind of you, you play, I guess you just use, you, you know, just I'd be just intrigued to, to how you, how I might do it. That's all because it's mm. a, because the way the instruments don't all point in the right, you know, necessarily the right direction. If you know what I mean, they're all pointing at each other a lot of the time, like trumpets yeah. pointing trumpets and things like that. So I'd be intrigued to see how you best, you know, how best I would do that if I had to do it a few times. Yeah, and do you ever? I'm not. I, I'm trying to think off the top of my head from some of the Spitfire libraries. I don't think many of them are too experimental when it comes to sort of orchestral setup. But do you ever have you worked on a few libraries where it is sort of a bit more? It's not just a traditional sort of orchestral setup when it comes to seating, and do you actually hear the difference in it? Like I've, I can't. There's a classical piece. I think it's a Mahler symphony that sets up a bit different, and you can hear the difference. Actually, they're live. Say so if you put trumpets up on an actual balcony instead of sitting down there where they usually sit like sort of etc yeah of course i mean yeah we often do recordings of, of musicians in kind of different places i mean the kind of most obvious of that is first and seconds um first violin second violins spread on one side to the other but mm. i did a really interesting recording with um joe trapanese for a film his version his film score for robin hood that was really different where he didn't like because it's quite a he didn't really like the, the, the immediacy of the, of the first violins. And so we ended up having the cello in, the, in a ring at the front, then violas behind them, and then the violins at the back and the basses out really wide. There's a, there's a video, you can look, okay. there's a video I did actually for, um, for Spitfire, in fact, where it was, we talk, where we talk, where we talked about it. It's not, a, it's not, you know, we didn't talk about it, but we just, you can see videos and things about it because it was interesting and, and Spitfire were happy to put it out and, as a, as a, I think I might have heard. seen when you're talking about it. If it is one I'm thinking about, I'll link it in. I'll link it in the yeah. description down below. But it's um, but it's it's really interesting because it it it, it, it it's a really it's slightly <laughs> different sound that it really worked well. But um, yeah, there's a I did a computer game for um, uh, Sony called Blood and Truth where we had the brass layout a bit different. We had horns on both sides and we had the big brass down the middle, and that sounds amazing. Mm. That's a called Blood and Truth by um, uh, Jim Fowler and Joe Thwaites. Um, really good you know like so that really works and then you do off off stage stuff for example yeah of course it's that that's, that sounds cool and does that make a difference then leading into sort of the, the mixing process when you do try out something different does it take a bit more time to sort of balance it back out to where instead of having a traditional setup yeah it does it does it requires a slightly different thought and um like you said it, the, the starting balance is always a bit different but it's but if, like i said if you get the recording right then it well, makes yeah. the mix easier yeah yeah, yeah. And then sort of one or two, I think one more thing I know so I'll definitely ask before I let you go. So now you're a very busy man. Um, when it comes to sort of mixing for um, a composer or sound engineer starting off, is there any sort of go-to plugins like there's like the other thing like must-haves that someone should have to make their life easier or just also then that are good to experiment with as well to get different sort of sounds? Of course, of course. I mean, I think for anybody in... Um, assuming this, this is more kind of soundtrack based. So I think a good reverb is, is important. So find the reverb that you like that works with your sound and, 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 and do that. Um, I think, you know, a good EQ is, is great. And I love the FabFilter Pro, Pro Q3 mm. because it's, 
and I do have lots of other. I have lots and lots of EQs, but I can imagine that's the one I go to. That's the one I go to most of the time because it just you can do everything with it. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. It's like, you know, it's the fact you can see the kind of the waveform and the fact you can put as many little nobles in as you want to, and now you can and you can also do it with MNS with it, and you can do the dynamic EQ. It's kind of it's it's so great. So from that point of view, you can because you can really tune in and fine tune that EQ, which is which is really helpful. Um, and you can just see before and after, which is really helpful to catch anything that's you mm. really, you know, not, not I'm saying you should mix with your eyes, but but if you just want to know where that really awkward frequency is, you yeah. can see it right there. And it just saves you loads of time. And it's it's about saving time so you can spend more time on the mix. Mm -hmm. And then, sorry. And then in terms of, sorry, in terms of like, kind of, in terms of like fun, fun, um, fun sounds, fun plugins, Difficult to say, really. It depends on the on the. It depends on the um, on the kind of vibe. But the Sound Toys ones are great. You know, like they're mm. they're the. I get a lot of mileage out of Echo Boy, which is fantastic because it's got so many things, which is great. It's got so many cool sounds. So that would be my kind of one other probably you know like go to go to one. I literally I was only thinking that because I someone shared in some composing group somewhere that they actually have a big massive sale on. Uh, I think. Every single one of their plugins actually at the minute, and like one or two composers mentioned Echo Boy, just saying like it's a must have for them just for what they can get out of it. Yeah, it really is. It's really clever because he it's got kind of good reverb you can make out of it, and it's got great delays. But then you can also just kind of do weird stuff with it as well. It's 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 a it's a great it's a great toy though. Yeah, and actually, I actually have thought of one more question for the last one. Is there cool. sort of any soundtrack genre specific like? When I when I write, I find a horror sort of the easiest one to write in a sense because I find there's there's no not that there's rules to anime, but there's not there's no sort of set rules to horror music. You can kind of just be really experimental with it as well. Nice. And yeah, yeah, do you, yeah. do you find that when sort of um, record like do you have a certain genre you enjoy to re record more when it comes to the sort of soundtrack genres that maybe yeah, you might feel there's just, there's no rules. You know, so you kind of don't know how the sounds got to turn out, and then you get to sort of mess around with it a bit later. Or, I think it's not necessarily genre. I think it's the filmmakers you might work with. It's people who are happy to trust the composer to do something, you know, that they really want to do. You trust their vision and, and let them do do that. So I think that's quite important. Um, so, so you know, like, uh, you know, but I mean, I do love like animations because, of course, you know, there's much more to, you can use much more uh, imagination in an yeah. uh, animation. Um, there's more things you have to, that you can kind of do and be, be there with so like you say horror is good because you know like you need the music kind of more to to do to sometimes help increase the, the tension and the anxiety um, mm -hmm. um no i think it often comes down to the personnel the ones the, the you know being 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 able to have a great melody is, is important too as well because that's why i love to hear a great melody i'm kind of a bit of an old old-fashioned when it <laughs> comes to that I, I do love a great melody and, and where you can where people are allowed to use that is is great yeah and then, then the last thing i will hit you before i let you go one of your favorite well i, I, I say it'd be hard for you to pick out a favorite memory but you mentioned like you're there when you heard the the bond sound being played live and then obviously your credit reel is Ridiculous! I wouldn't. I've I've left spend a good half an hour reading out the rest of the press. I read them all out. But you go from listening to Bond, then you go listen to something like Cinderella. That you worked on complete two different complete sounds. But do you have like some one sort of memory just sticks out a lot at air to where you've like you're sitting maybe there in the room, just thinking, God, I'm I'm hearing this live because surely you must have tons over the years. Like, yeah, I mean, I think the Bond one is important because that's the, you know that was that's a, a real thing. I think um, the first time I kind of went out. Into the um, into the room while um, orchestral were playing. I went out. There was a real youngster. I went out and I heard that. It was incredible, and uh, uh, that's really sticks in my mind. Um, let me think. Kind of real. I was there moment. I've definitely got them, but it's funny. It's it's always trying to recall them under pressure. Yeah, when you're put, yeah, when you're putting the spot, it's always like, yeah. and then as soon as you that, go off, you're just like, oh, yeah. The I mean, yeah if, you, if you'd asked me that twenty minutes ago. Um, let me think. Um, let me think. Um, I think um, Sweeney Todd was pretty amazing to like okay. to, 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 to to see that being performed by um, the orchestra without they, we did that without click a lot of that stuff and to watch them doing that with the with the conductor was was amazing and to be in the same room as as um, 
uh, yeah, Stephen was amazing, you know. Um, um, I'm sure there's something else as well, but um, that I'll have to do. Too many, me, too many to recall. Too many, yeah, to too many. many. I mean, I think, yeah, I think, um, I mean, I think, you know, like, as a tape up I and mean, working on the first Harry Potter movie was amazing, you know, like yeah. and seeing that and how that's going back and I can still listen to that music and put place myself back in that room was amazing. But I think that's, I think that's what it is. It's, it's the memories where I can, I can transport myself back to that time and exact, remember where those are. Mm-hmm. It's amazing for that. And um, yeah. And yeah I, and the first time I, was, I guess the first time I was at Abbey Road was pretty amazing as well. You know, being it, at you such know, a historical yeah, yeah. studio. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I actually one more before I let you go because yeah, cool, I just yeah, realised. Yeah. Um, do you find it obviously you, you're talking about collaboration with directors and composers? Do you find it's just as collaborative with you being the sound recorder as, as well? Like that you aren't just put. Obviously, you have a very high reputation beside, so you might actually be called in for a lot of collaboration. But do you find like sometimes maybe a sound engineer or someone that's just sitting there might be just sort of pushed side like, "Oh, you just re- you just record the sound and we'll take care of the rest." Or do you find it collaborative? It depends on the on the um, on the on the he goes in a room. I mean, in, yeah. in the nicest possible way. I, I, I'm just I couldn't for better, think of a better word. But I mean, I am somebody who likes to put my opinion forward. Yeah. Start so to start with, or you know, if I know that people want me to input, then I will do. And I'll always ask, you know, like you happy for me to you know to stick my nose in? And if they say yeah, great. If they don't, oh, I'll realise soon off if I don't. But I did. Um, I did a film score called Emma that came out um, just before uh, came out on, on, on Valentine's Day. That, that was uh, where I got on really well with the director, and she really relied on me to help her out. So, mm. I mean, I, the, the, the two composers, obviously, you know, we became a little team with the, the kind of four of us. But it was, it was that was where I've had a really good relationship with the director, and and, and she was my my opinion became important to her too as a kind of as a as a extra to the composers so yeah it, it really depends on the project but um and some things have a lot of producers like particularly computer games they have they have producers mm. who are involved um tv shows could stuff. be the same as well sometimes yeah i guess switch, so yeah, yeah. It's, it's yeah it, it depends but it, you but um <laughs> yeah i often i always I, I don't shrink unless i'm unless i realize it, my my opinion is 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 not helpful and then i'll say okay right Let's, let's let's sit back on this one today, Jake, and have a have a, a quiet ride. <laughs> Fair enough. Well, then, just before I let you go, do you have anything to it? I'm not sure really to announce, but any projects sort of coming up that people can keep their eye out for that you've been involved that you're allowed to announce, um, I suppose. Yeah, of course. Um, I think um, I think certainly um, Green Knight's interesting from a musical point of view. I really like that. Um, there's uh, a film score that I'm doing with Nick Kevin Wanderlust, which is the film's going to be amazing. Um, I think I'm allowed to say what well, that's. You know, maybe I can't <laughs> what it is, but um, it's going to be cool. Um, and uh, there's a really interesting thing I'm really proud of that Spitfire releasing on th- this Thursday. So we've oh, yeah. when it comes out, but um, that's pretty interesting. What that's going to be. Um, so that's pretty cool. Um, and there's a couple of other things in the Spitfire pipelines that are. That are we recorded and haven't come out yet so they're cool um what other unfortunately a lot of my other things have have kind of have hit you know like i've hit covid time oh, so it's a bit times, yeah. it's one of those funny things but and then and there is a there's a great album that i've worked been working mixing called um it's kind of folky folky pop i guess you could call it so uh, by a band called uh, blanco white okay. and there's a there's a bunch of there's a few, first few of the out of the you know, the album tracks have been released as singles. Um, oh. It's really nice. I'm really proud of that. And that comes out uh, beginning of June, I think. So um, there you go. Listen out for that. Cool. Well, Jake, thanks very much again for coming on. I know how busy Pleasure. you do, do be nowadays. So thanks very much. So, guys, I hope you've actually learned a bit from Jake. I'm sure he's all that have ever listened to this. I know I did. So, and I'll see you on the next podcast. <laughs>